Black Talk Radio Network is made possible in part with help from the Black Talk Media Project, a North Carolina-based nonprofit engaged in the production and distribution of independent digital black media. Find out more by going to blacktalkradionetwork.com or blacktalkmediaproject.org and look for the menu tab, Crowdfunding Black Media. Black Talk Media Project, helping to provide you with new black media for the new millennium. opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Body and Soup Radio Show. I don't, I don't know why I, I feel like I have to sing that, knowing that I cannot sing. But I always feel like I have to put that into a little melody. <laughs> well, you know something? My... You know something? Ooh, hello, namaste, namaste, namaste. Nam- namaste. I, want, I, want, <laughs> I want to say there is a proverb, an African but I'm sure you're familiar with it. And it says, if you can talk, you can sing. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. you can walk, you can dance. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we're not trying to say we can sing well enough to get paid. But we can sing. be on somebody's stage but our public. Right. You're, you're, on on stage. you're on your stage. You're on your stage. That's right. That's Right. Yes. That's right. Yes. My stage. It's my world. It's my world. <laughs> That's it. My world. <laughs> and welcome into our world here at yes. the Mind, Body, and Spirit radio show. And namaste to you, Trevor Light. I hope that all is well and hope that your week has been going well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I am doing well. I'm doing well. Namaste to you. Namaste to everybody. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm Borrow your mind and your spirit and your whatever you, your ears for the next couple of hours and share some information and just share what we have. have a dialogue. Yeah, have yeah. A, have a have a great, interesting um, dialogue around colorism. Assimilation and other barriers for women of color. And um, let me just give out the phone number eight six six five one zero nine zero two five is the number to dial. And you can press star star to unmute yourself, and you can just uh, join in on this conversation that we'll have tonight here at Mind Body and Spirit. And you can always send your uh, letters. To mind, body, and spirit. About um, if you have any questions about life, your spiritual journey, relationships, health, dating, career questions, love, sex, etc., and etc., you can send your letters to mind, body, spirit radio show at gmail dot com. And be sure that you um, log on to Black Talk. Radio Network and donate to the Black Talk Media Project because we want to keep Black Talk Radio alive and kicking right, uh, right, feather light. I almost said right, namaste. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm trying to get so in the mood of saying namaste, namaste. <laughs> yeah, trying yes, to like you are calm so. myself down. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, bring myself to a calm state and yes, yes. more relaxed yes. and calm. Yes. Yes, because I would love to teach one of those yoga classes or like a five rights or um, the elements classes. And so I have to have that calm voice that people have when they teach yoga. And right. I'll talk like this <laughs> and I'll say things like that <laughs> while I'm in class. So I'm trying to <laughs> practice that. Along with speaking like Nina Simone, so I can say go, go, you're a pretty go, a lovely go, or something like that. Anyway, the child is in your care. In your care. The child is in your care. <laughs> and people are going to say, now wait a minute, she didn't used to speak like that in 1985. Like, I guess I mean, evolve, evolve, people. I, guess, I mean, it's not like I didn't tell you that I was going to start saying, instead of saying care, I'm going to say care. Yeah. <laughs> you put that little extra something on the end. That's what makes people different, you know. you got to have something right. that makes you stand out. And right. speaking of right. a person that stands out, let's let, let me send out my happy birthday, happy born day wishes to one of my favorite artists in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm practicing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> in the entire world. <laughs> Prince Rogers Nelson. It is yes. June the seventh. Yes. yes, his birthday, and we are honoring Prince again tonight mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> with the uh, African Spirit Award. Um, you know, he passed in uh, uh, April, April twenty first of last year. So we did um, honor Prince. In the month of April, but this is his birthday month, so we're honoring him mm-hmm. again. And since again. we're airing again, and uh, mm-hmm. since we're airing tonight on his birthday, I mean, it's only natural to salute Prince Rogers Nelson. And I know somebody like that song, uh, Soft and Wet. <clears throat> That's oh, yeah. a good one. I love that one. And, uh, oh, yeah, Soft and Wet. But I think... Um, Gosh, I mean, he just has so many. He's like Marvin Gaye with me. I mean, there's, I, I have a list of favorites. Like, I can't just mm-hmm. say, oh, well, my favorite song by Marvin Gaye is, or my favorite song oh, by yeah. Prince or Michael Ooh. Jackson. I have a list of favorite songs um, by right. Prince, So, and I probably could narrow it down to five, top, uh, to a top five. I can give you, I can give you a top five. Prince songs, and of course, Purple Rain is on that list. Right. So, um, yes, 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 yes. Today is his birthday, so we'll honor him. But um, yes, born day. So tonight we're talking about uh, colorism, assimilation, and other barriers for women of color. Um, Do most or a certain group of black men? prefer light skin tone women, lighter skin tone women, and why do darker skin tone women feel less attractive than their lighter sisters? Why some of them may feel right. that way or are made to feel that way or, or, or that right. that stigma, um, uh, that, that stigma, that, that, that stigma lies with some of our darker sisters, our brown sisters, mm-hmm. our chocolate sisters, uh, that, that you're not as pretty. Yeah, uh, we're we're aware of prejudice. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And so what is colorism and, and how does it affect the black community? And, you know, what I find quite often is we get so stuck into the argument between the light, lighter skinned 
tone people and black and darker skinned people that we don't even look at the actual root cause. You know, I'm always talking about let's get down to the nucleus let's get of it all. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's get and to the should. origin. Let's get to the nucleus of it. Why do you eat why let's talk about why 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 there's this variation and um although I mean people depending on what part of the earth you you live, your planet you live, uh then your skin tone uh, may be a different color, is a different color, and that's fine. But I mean, let's talk about why we feel like a certain skin tone is 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 uh, uh, has more access to affluence or opportunities. Why do some people feel like that, or why do they feel like that certain skin tone is is prettier, or that one is is uh, not as attractive? So we will delve into colorism and how it affects the black community. And, it, and, and let's see if we can get past the argument amongst each other because that's often what happens, right. the argument amongst us instead of having um, a progressive conversation around this topic and let's heal. And there's an awesome Instagram page that I came across in researching this topic and it's called uh, Color, Col- Colorism Healing, Colorism Healing. So you can find out more information and, of course, there are tons of videos uh, on YouTube and across the web. Uh, but, yeah, that's uh, Instagram at Colorism Healing. Uh, do, 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 do. And so we're going to dig into that and, and some of the barriers. And satellite, you will have a mind by Spirit, love the body for us tonight and breathing. I so look forward to all of that. Lord knows I need to just take some time and just breathe. I did meditate briefly before coming on air and that was quite helpful. Mm-hmm. It's like I've been on the on the move for the most part. Well my mind has been occupied in some form or fashion since I since I rose from my bed this morning, so I so look forward to the breathing sessions that you provide for us here at Mind Body Spirit. So thank you so much for the light. You're quite welcome. So you have a quote for us? Yes, our quote tonight is: How can we expect the world? to deal justly with us when we won't even deal justly with one another. It's what you just mentioned. There's so much um, fighting within our community and indifference about things that happen to us, apathy, um, Downright joking about tragedy, you know, um, and then, and then when it comes out in the wash that that uh, it appears that we have been we have not received the justice that we uh, we know we deserve, um, then then there's there's anger and there's there's disillusionment. It's like how how could that happen? I mean. It's clear that this happened, and and and, and it was clear that this, and it's clear that that, and, and it it turned out like this. What's going on here? Well, I mean, imagine imagine you see uh, a few people in some quicksand, and and, and they're stinking, um, and and it's obvious that they're going to disappear, you know, on the earth. And and you want to throw them a, a, a lamb or a stick or something, but they're, they're fighting each other. Where they're in the where they're in the quicksand, and of course, while they're fighting each other, all this movement, unnecessary movement, that makes them sink mm-hmm. lower. So you are like, well, you sounds just keep on my way mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they may pull me down the way they carry mm-hmm. on. So I mean, mm-hmm. people see us. People mm-hmm. see us fighting among each other in the, in the face of tragedy, all this killing, um, the children being 
tossed around by 300 pound policemen, um, women being pulled out of cars, beaten on live TV, old men just stabbed, killed, and, and then we wonder. We yeah. wonder. So we're not being just with ourselves. And until that happens, we cannot expect others to deal justly with us. Mm. Ooh, what do you say about that? I agree. Um, and, I, and I'll also dovetail that with, I was just watching, let me see. I believe I was watching one of these videos on colorism, and there was someone from another country that left a comment. Uh, we're, in, we're in the United States, um, Houston, Texas, and uh, there was someone from another country. I will not mention that country because I want that country to still be able to come in and help <clears throat> if need be. But the person left a comment, and, and the person said, and this was a... Uh, gentleman, and he said, with all that um, blacks and African Americans and Africans have gone through, whenever, whenever all of you rise up, you certainly have help from this country. And we have always mm -hmm. known that, and, and we've always, well, you know, those of us in our communities and, and you know, our, our specific groups. We know that there are uh, people, say, for instance, like Castro, uh, Cuba, let me just say Cuba, um, that was willing to assist, like, uh, just like uh, Castro assisted in the uh, Angolian War. So mm -hmm. um, we know that, that there are countries that are willing to come to our, our aid if there ever was a time when um, black people in mass rose up, not just like the different... Um, Rebellions that may have taken place, like in New Jersey or Chicago or something like that, but just like in mass, you know, not just Watts, but just all over right. the country and and, and the world. <clears throat> but you know, I have faith that <clears throat> through our actions, um, things will change because I can already see things changing, and. Um, I just see I see things changing. I really do. And I'm staying staying hopeful. And I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to to exist in this time where I can see the tables turning and things are changing. And it may get a little a little rougher before it gets better, but <clears throat> we'll get there. Oh absolutely. We'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get there. We'll get there. <clears throat> you know how I know we'll get there? Because Chokwe anti Lumumba was elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi today, and oh. he's only 34 years of age. And some people may remember, um, we actually we, we actually uh, um, had a show on a show on uh, Mayor Chokwe Lumumba before or well, after he passed, because he he had only been mayor for like a year. His father, I'm speaking of, revolutionary uh, attorney, who was also the mm -hmm. attorney of. Tupac and Asada Shakur. Um, Chokwe Lumumba was only in office for one year, and I mean, from what I understand, Jackson, Mississippi, was about to uh, be the paradigm for what how we should be living here on this planet, mm -hmm. all around the world, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. cooperatively, um, nobody being hungry or homeless. So. <clears throat> Anyway, so, you know, then Al Sharpton went and had dinner with him, and then next thing you know, um, Chokwe Lumumba was dead. So anyway, uh, his son, well, not anyway, but his son, Lumumba, Chokwe anti Lumumba, 34, decided to pick up that mantle and continue on with the plans that his father and his team had. Um, and he did win by a landslide victory. I think you can see here, ninety-three percent of the vote. Ninety-three wow. percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Jackson Mayor Tony Yarbor conceded the Democratic primary to Lumumba um, before it even um, before the election, because <laughs> it was just clear 
that people oh. had selected him. Mm-hmm. So he is going to continue oh. the radical and transformative work that shaped his parents' lives. And let me just give a little bit on uh, Chokwe. Yeah, um, Chokwe was, uh, you know, the, I believe it was the second second vice president of the Republic of New Africa, and he was born in D Town, the D rather the D Detroit. And mm-hmm. uh, let me see, he was a human rights lawyer, and I believe he graduated summa cum laude at Wayne State. And Wayne State is a uh, popular law school there in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, let's see, his parents were Priscilla Telefero and Lucian Telefero. And so Chokwe, Chokwe, the name Chokwe comes from the Chokwe people who resisted slavery, and Lumumba comes from Patrice Lumumba, who was assassinated. assassinated. And if you have not, or if you do not know, um, if you're unfamiliar with Patri- Patrice Lumumba, you know, me, I'm always like, just Google, uh, purchase a book on Lumumba, Patrice, YouTube, doc- the documentary. There's um, like an actual documentary, and then there's one where, who, let me see, I'm trying to think who portrayed Patrice Lumumba in this uh, document. I can't recall right now, but you can always uh, view those online. And um, he was also the founder, and this is the, this is the father. He was the founder of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and as I mentioned, attorney for Tupac and Asada Shakur. So we know what time it is with uh, the brother, right? Okay, and his son. All right, right. black nationalist. Okay, that's right, a, a real one, a real one. Okay, and so. Um, Chokwe and Ta Lumumba, we with best wishes for you, and may he stay protected. Behind may you. he stay on yes. the path. On yes, mm-hmm. continue, continue the struggle. And uh, I love him because when he gets to that podium, he says, "Free the land, baby," and that's the call. Mm-hmm. Free the land, yeah. free the land, and free all political prisoners. That's right, that's mm-hmm. right, that's right. Free the land mm-hmm. and free all political prisoners. Exactly. Right. So, uh, congrats, okay. congrats, congrats, congrats. I mean, the, uh, I'm going, I am definitely going to monitor what's going on, and uh, we'll try to interview some people and have them come on the radio and keep us informed, because I do know a brother that was actually working with a uh, senior before he mm-hmm. transitioned. So, uh, heck, because I may move to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. My goodness. With what they're getting ready to get going on down there. Yes, ma'am. I can do Jackson. I can do Jackson, Mississippi. I certainly can. Mm -hmm. I can do Jackson. I think, think, let me see. Body of water is close. I think that'll be close to uh, Delta, too. And I can always go over there because they have Black Beach there. In May, so there's a beach there close to Delta. We did see that beach there. That's, that's a pretty nice beach. I have to be near a body of water, though. But I prefer to mm-hmm. live on an island. Mm. Prefer to live on an island, though. But uh, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, so therapeutic. So therapeutic. Um, this Channel View teacher, just briefly, I have to mention this. This Channel View teacher. Um, the one that gave this student an award for most likely to become a terrorist here in the Houston area. She is no longer with the district, but she could always move to another district, possibly, from my understanding. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like, okay, let, let me just let me just refresh everyone's memory on this story. The award was given to seventh grader Lizeth Villeneuve. Villeneuve. And she received the award during a mock award ceremony at Anthony Aguirre Junior High School. And this is in the Channel View area of Houston, Texas, just right outside Houston, Texas. It's a little suburb of Houston. And so uh, this story made national news, too. Um, So the teacher, when she gave this little girl the award, she said, oh, this may offend others, but I really don't care about their feelings. And the other teachers just 
laughed along with her as they gave this little girl this award. And then, now the way that this story um, uh, went viral and his his social media and went viral is there was another student in the classroom, a little black girl who received the award for most likely to be accepted by white people. She was the most less, most likely to be accepted or blend in. To blend in. To blend in. To blend in with white people. Mm-hmm. Right. And so her mother actually uh, posted the video, and the video went viral. Mm. So um, my Latino mothers, uh, we're going to need y'all to step up and start calling this stuff out. I know some of you may not want to or may be new to it or whatever the case may be. But listen, we cannot let these people um, attack our children and degrade them and debase them like this. That's horrible. And when she uh, when she gave out that award, hang that out was here, the so day if you after that attack, in, that attack in um, Paris. So this was oh. like world news. So I mean, this this, this affected mm. these children and people. And yeah. then you give this child this award, most likely to be a terrorist. Are you insane? So my thought is, not only should she have been fired from that school and that district, but just like a police officer, she should not be allowed to transfer over to another district and be absolved by another district or another police department. Understand? Exactly. And see, this is what happens. These teachers or these police officers, because right now they're looking like really quite similar in some cases, okay? Mm-hmm. And so um, the way they dragging these little babies through the hallway, every time you turn around, especially here in Texas, either you have some uh, a teacher that has assaulted some little child, and, and I mean like uh, sexually assaulted. We have a lot of pedophilia going on with these teachers. Some of these teachers, so-called teachers, let me say that, because we have a, a lot of great teachers, uh, uh, an abundance of extraordinarily great teachers here in Houston, Texas, in Texas, period, and across the country for that matter. But just like any other profession, you you just have these people that have evil intentions, and it seems like many of these pedophiles, this is a way that they are they're using this avenue as a teacher to gain access to these children. And with that yeah, being a sickness or illness or whatever people, however you want to categorize it, the, this is this is the avenue that they're using to um, becoming to to kind of connect with their prey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so you better be careful. You really, really, really should be careful. And right now, a lot of these schools are now getting ready to allow people that don't actually really have a teaching certification to come in and teach in the schools because jobs are so scarce now. So it's like, oh, if you have that skill, we'll let you come on in. You see how certain avenues are open for people when, when, when jobs are pretty scarce? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, we're in the community. We can, I mean, yeah, I mean, just like, it's just like the uh, opioid, uh, opioid uh, addiction with all the resources now be avail- being available, housing and health care and all of this. But, hey, when, when the crack epidemic was decimating our families and communities, there was no help, nothing but jail, nothing but incarceration. But now if you hooked on some um, opioids and all that, you're about to die, about to OD and all of this, oh, my God, you can probably get you a nice little apartment, get some food stamps, mm-hmm. all you know, of, some food all assistance. Hell yeah, I mean, you know, you you might do pretty good. Listen, if you don't have any money, you might want to, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say, maybe you can <laughs> pretend like you, you can't find a job, just pretend like you're an addict. Get some free resources that uh, Obama made available for, it, for all the addicts. I mean, nothing was available for us. these families that were torn apart by this crack cocaine that was deliberately deliberately deposited into our communities. And I'm going to always remind people of that. <clears throat> so, never forget. Never, never forget, forget how we got where never. we are. That's right. That's right. And we see the generational effects of that. These poor little children out here don't have nothing and nobody, some of them. I mean, we've had, like, just about two generations of young people that have basically had to raise themselves or be raised by grandparents or raised by the streets or raised by foster parents. 
And uh, uh, gosh, goodness. All right, we're going to pull it together. <clears throat> we'll, we'll pull it together. Let me touch on this Flint water crisis story um, briefly. People may have heard about this Phil Stair. Uh, he mm. resigned as sales manager of the Genesee County Land Bank that manages foreclosed homes in Flint, Michigan. After a recording surfaced Sunday in which he blames the city's water crisis on the inwards who don't pay their bills. So basically he said that the inwards um, don't pay their bills and that's why the water crisis has happened, which we know that that is not the case. So he was uh, recorded by a local environmental uh, environmentalist activist, Chelsea Lyons is her name. And let's see. So he speaks about how Detroit um, switched over, well, how Flint switched over, and this sparked the crisis. And so now this has been going on since since 2014. Uh, the city's water uh, water plan failed to properly properly treat the more toxic water under orders from state officials, causing lead from old pipes old pipes to leach into the city's water. Uh, but this man stare, he traces the crisis to residents not paying their water bills. You know, this is just insane. And this is how these people try to justify um, genocide. So uh, let me just briefly read his comments. So he, this is what stare was recorded saying. Detroit was charging all of its customers for the cost. They weren't collecting from their residents. They weren't shutting the water off. They were letting bills go forever, but they were charging everybody else. They covered them. Well, Flint has the same problem as Detroit. F and N words, uh, F and niggers is what he says. Don't pay their bills. Believe me, I deal with them. I don't want to call them niggers. Um, he just goes on using foul, foul language. Then he pulls out that you know, we need to figure out this. Uh, when You know how when some white people say, oh, you're using the race card? When they use that black card, when they say, oh, but, uh, you know, I have black friends. Because right. you know, with that, that, <laughs> that common, um, I just went to Myrtle Beach with 24 guys, and I was the only white guy. Uh, <laughs> you went to Myrtle Beach with 24 guys. That sounds like that was a work trip to me. That sounds like that. Right. <laughs> Like a man, right. you know, some type of a corporate trip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he said, yes. uh, "Yeah, he has friends." And so he was pretty inebriated during this conversation. So a lot of this sounds like a just incoherent rambling. And he just goes on saying, "There's trash, and there's people that do this." And I can just hear him now. They don't pay the mm -hmm. bills. Well, Detroit didn't collect on their bills, so. They charged everybody else but Flint. Flint has to pay their bill to Detroit. I can hear him saying that now, sitting up there drunk, mm -hmm. drunk as a mm -hmm. skunk. Um, so let's see. So, of course, we know that uh, the governor, Rick Snyder, I'm still not understanding this whole deal about Rick Snyder. I, I'm, I'm just not. I'm, I'm not even going to say anything over air. Anyway. Uh, he did not acknowledge the crisis until late in 2015 after experts found that there was a sharp increase in the number of children with elevated lead levels in their blood. And, you know, it was uh, discovered or uh, stated after, let me see, what's that, what's that doctor's name? Uh, Anna, Anna, oh God, Anna Natasha, I think that's her name. Um, and the professors, the team from Virginia State tested the pipes and found that um, the lead was in the, in the uh, water. And there is no safe exposure 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 level for lead. And so huh. these poor little children, these poor little children and, and the adults will suffer. Uh, well, they were made to suffer. This, this to me, just like I called it with Katrina, with Hurricane Katrina, when I said back then. In 2005, that those levees were deliberately blown up to flood those areas. People thought I was crazy. I said, "Okay, okay, yep. Yep. okay." 
Okay, well, I said watch it come out. Watch it come out. Just wait. And sure enough, it, it did. did. So, yeah, I it called did. it. Like I call a lot of this it foolishness, did. but now they just do so many crazy things, I really can't call it. But with this whole Flint thing, I called this one because people are now saying that um, what what people are doing is waiting on all of the people to to be to be removed, systematically removed from the Flint area, and then they would gentrify it. Flint is going to be like Vegas in probably 10 ah. to 15 or 20 years. Mark my words. When people listen to this in, what is this, June the 7th, 2017, I guarantee you Flint will be like Lake Tahoe. Watch. Mm. Watch, watch, watch. So if you're into investing in land and property, I suggest purchase some of that land and property right now in Flint and Detroit and just sit on it. Sit on it. It'll be like Vegas. Mark my words. So it, um, um, it was mm-hmm. it was something that said that some bank was sitting on about twenty homes, right? That oh, empty forty yes. something like this that. This particular this bank that this um that this character Phil Stare, his this bank where he's the sales manager, and so they're sitting on all of these homes, knowing that people are homeless in Detroit and Flint, Michigan, and Benton Harbor. And this is all that these people are doing is because that is that is prime, prime, prime property there in that area. That's that's anything that's close to the water is prime property. All of it, all of that is 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 close to the water there in Michigan. And Flint, Flint was once a boom town. It was a boom, 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 boom town. And just like Pontiac, now it's just destroyed. When you pull the complete bottom. Out of a city, and that's what happened to cities like Detroit and Flint. And then when you look at these cities, and you say, "Well, what do they have in common? What do those cities have in common?" So, um, a thriving black 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 population. If you if you hadn't figured it out. So anyway, um, let's see. So Flint residents have had to pay some of the highest rates for drinking water, which is Ah, obscene and absurd. The state gave residents discounts on water bills after acknowledging the emergency, but but suspended the credit the credits earlier this year. Okay, right. this, this is crazy. Why are you making people pay for poison water? And see, this is where I, the reason why I really want to wanted to speak on this story is because you have all of these people that have been marching. Uh, for uh, uh, the environment and all this talk about Donald Trump and the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Paris climate talks and all this business and over 30 cities have come together because we need to come together on this climate deal so, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, we need to fight for the environment. But you have people in Flint that are suffering from environmental race uh, racism. You have people in North Carolina that are having hog feces sprayed on them. Right. Oh, my God. So, I mean, organize around that, too. I mean, we can do something right here, right now. Right here, right now. Hmm. And I'm not in Flint right now, but I know when I was in the Flint area, I didn't see a lot of... uh, Organized and by environmentalists, I saw people giving out Nestle water. So it sounds like to me, if you if you research Flint, you'll see how Nestle was all connected in this whole Flint water crisis. So it, to me, it's just another way to for, for Nestle to make money, make money all the way around. Yeah, yeah. Door, I mean, you you, you, you 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 poison that water, so now they have to buy water for Nestle. Come on, from you, know, you. these people. They they keep a scam going on. They keep a they keep a Ponzi scheme going on. They need to let Rupert Madoff Madoff was not not Rupert but what's that other one? Um, the other scam man Murdoch or something. I don't know. All of those people sound Adam. the same to me. Um, what's his name? The one that was running the big scam, the Ponzi scheme. I, I can't call it. Me. Madoff. Um, yeah, matter or whatever. M A, M A. Mhm, mhm. Yeah, because Rupert is the 
um, media person. So, but anyway, the man that was running the Ponzi scheme, you need to let him out because all of this is a Ponzi scheme. So if you're locking him up for that, for that then lock all of these other people up for this Ponzi scheme, like this educational Ponzi scheme. Have these people going to college, we obtain all these degrees, and then you come out and you still can't find a job because it's a Ponzi scheme. You just, I'm like my grandmother now. You just wants to go up to the YMCA, YWCA, and take pick up a carpentry skill, learn carpentry or learn how to paint learn or something Maddox. like that for six weeks. Exactly. Bernie exactly. Madoff is his name. Oh, Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. That's it. That's it. I that wanted is, to say hey, Bernie, Madoff. but then I was thinking about Bernie Sanders. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Because I kept saying Bernie, Bernie, Because I think there's a documentary of him on HBO mm. or something like that. Yes. Yeah. But uh, have you heard this Kendrick Lamar story, Satellite? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Kendrick Lamar, uh, the the yeah. artist, uh, rapper. See, see how we judge each other. See how we throw against each other. Oh my God! Stuff like that. All of that energy, we could be we could be putting it to a dress. All of mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. energy about mm-hmm. nonsense. So so what the one else buys this? Let let me just tell Please. the story for people that are not familiar with it because this is silly. And just as she mentioned, you can put that energy towards energy towards um, helping people out in Flint. So um, Kendrick Lamar purchased a, I think it's a Toyota Camry for his sister's graduation, and people were like slamming him apparently on Twitter and social media because I guess they feel like, well, since you're a hot artist, which you ought to know by now, these artists don't really make any money unless they're on tour, unless they're endorsed by something, uh, some some company or something. Right, they don't make right. any money off their out music. The songs, literally, <laughs> they take it off the song, the lyrics, literally. I got this. They don't really have all of that. Right, and furthermore, the man has this song called "Be Humble," and so, from my understanding, people said that he's pretty much been that type of brother for quite a while. A very mm-hmm. humble brother, and so mm-hmm. a Toyota Camry is a it's a nice car. It's it's a good car. Toyota Camrys are good cars, and his yeah. career is not the type of career whereas um, he's guaranteed to be a millionaire for the rest of his life or a multimillionaire. So why would he even put his himself in debt like that, purchasing all right. of these Ferraris and Maseratis and a, a Porsche truck for his sister. A Toyota Camry, Camry, so she can get around. Is just fine. It's just fine. So Kendrick Lamar, which I know he's not any, not even worrying about what these silly people are saying. They need to get themselves together because at least Kendrick Lamar, I'm sure, has a few commas in his uh, bank account statement. And so, I mean, hey, he probably was able to go pay cash for the car and be done with it. <laughs> and it's a car that his sister would be able to take care of the maintenance or he would. Even if he even if he didn't uh produce another album, another hit. So anyway, that's just stupid. That's just absolutely crazy. So um Father Light, you wanna share your spoken word? Or you have some thoughts on Kendrick Lamar. You were you were speaking on this uh, it's story. none of their damn yeah. business. It's none of their <laughs> damn business. That's all I have to say. Mm. That's all I have to say. <laughs> none of your damn business. Good day, sir. It's not none of your business. Good day, sir. It's not any of your business, sir. What that man is buying his little sister. Good day, sir. So, yes, anyway, good day, sir. Uh, good day, Stand sir. down. Stand down. <laughs> Okay. Silly stuff. So, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. My spoken word for this week. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking. Our topic is about barriers for Black women, and uh, one of them, of course, is colorism. And there are many other barriers. Uh, 
it would take several shows for us to go through them all. In fact, this colorism will take several shows, I'm sure. But I thought that this was appropriate for tonight. It's a, it's, uh, it's called Guilty, and it's actually a song by Gladys Knight. It's on her album, um, a CD called Just For You. And um, the words to the song uh, were very appropriate for our subject for tonight. So I will just express her song in spoken okay. words. And there's a black right. woman having to deal with the, the psychological burdens of, of living with the many false images and, and myths imposed by this society. You've got dual minority status, you black and, and female. You've got colorism, persecution, and white flight of our men, all while struggling to live and work in this unjust society and, and maintain a, a positive attitude, a sense of identity. Well, it gets extremely heavy at times. The title of this <clears throat> piece is called Guilty. There's my guess. Okay. Just pretend. I'm guilty of so many things. Of being desperate for the love and the joy that I know life should bring. I'm guilty of, of doing without social acceptance, the proper respect, and the essence of what life's all about. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of being poor in a world where the richest determine your worth, not the measure of your character, as it should be down here on earth. So go on and sentence me or set me free because you can't see I'm guilty for just being me. I'm guilty for loving and hating just the same as anyone. I'm guilty for wanting the best life can offer for my daughters and my son. You know, it's two strikes against me when I come up to bed. One strike for being female and one strike for being black. So I stand tall through it all. My head held high. Because I know I'll be female and black until the day I die. Mm -mm -mm. I'm guilty of watching society persecute and dehumanize my man while watching him struggle to survive among people who won't lend a hand. So if you walk in my shoes, you're going to end up with the blues. Because you'll see why I'll be guilty for just being me. Namaste and thank you for that. Namaste. We're giving you your uh, finger snaps. Yes, thank you. Like they do with the spoken word. Thank you so much thank for sharing Gladys. that. I, I'll, yes, I always have loved that song by Gladys. And I love Gladys Knight anyway. Thank Gladys you. Knight in the pits. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, I'm leaving. Leaving <laughs> on that midnight train to Georgia. Leaving on the midnight train. <laughs> but uh, yeah, guilt, guilt, guilty of just being me. Just being me. This is me. This is me. Yeah. How many times have we had to temper ourselves and and not be yourself and and yeah. be someone else uh, to be accepted or, or loved or. Uh, invited, so yeah, we often have to. And you know, we 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 get this this slam, um, mm -hmm. the black the angry black woman. 
but we have so much right, I mean, to be angry. We really do. It, it's difficult to hold it down. And, and yes, yeah, sometimes it's it just, I can't take it. And it's just like, oh, I can't take mm -hmm. it. But like that song with Salah. Salah, um, yeah, I was going to mention that. You have a right yeah. to be angry, she says in that yeah. song. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, because right. people let people know. Yes. Yes, yes. To deal with. All the psychological trauma and drama, as I always say. All the psychological trauma and drama and okay. um, feeling less than and having to be superwoman. That's just, just too much. It's too much pressure. And that's something that we we're talking about tonight, and that plays into this whole colorism topic. Uh, let me see if, uh, Scotty, are we able to play that clip? Clip one. And this is a clip um, with India Ari speaking. She's being interviewed by Oprah if we could play this clip. And this clip is on um, how colorism, I think this is, it's, let me see, is this the Indian, Indian area? Uh, says Indian there Indian is one clip destructive or? and deep-rooted issue that she often finds yes. in her work. Because this is an issue that wreaks havoc, particularly in the African-American community, but in other communities as well. In Latin communities, in uh, Asian Indian communities, and uh -huh. even, uh, you know, I understand in uh, some of the Southern Asian, whether it's Chinese, Vietnamese, the, the issue of colorism. Color. You know? Colorism, it's called. It is the light-skinned, dark-skinned prejudice where people of color discriminate against each other within their own race. Now, you may have seen the documentary uh, uh, called Dark Girls. Did you all see that? Uh, very good. Bill Duke, a few months ago on OWN. And it generated one of the biggest online discussions we've ever had. And it really boils down to the belief that the lighter your skin tone, the prettier you are, the smarter you are, the more valuable and worthy you are. True. Yeah. And, and, and the easier you have it, you know, that's the perception. So colorism has been around for a very long time. What, 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 where did it come from? Well, it, its roots are really in, it go all the way back to slavery, where the uh, slave women were bred and created children, and the children became lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And that the mother herself was often left out in the field, and she therefore became a field hand, I'll say hand. <clears throat> and the lighter women were taken into the house to serve the mistress to, to uh, do the taking. And the, the lighter children. women, they were lighter because everybody came over as Africans. That's right. And as brown-skinned Africans, dark, dark, dark brown, black Africans. Africans. African Americans today are so far removed from that reality till they don't even recognize the lasting cellular and genetic impact that it still has on us, that we still have colorism, light skin, dark skin, you're better than, more worthy than. They, yeah. they don't even... And you're better than because the closer you are to being white, yes. the better you are. All right, so that was actually Oprah Winfrey and Iana Van Zant speaking um, speaking on this the, the topic of colorism. And as it was mentioned, colorism it's an issue in our community um, where we have been it's been ingrained in some of us to feel that uh, light skin is more valuable, as Iana mentioned is more valuable than dark skin or, or lighter skin can afford you more privileges. Um, you're, you are viewed as, as prettier. Um, and some of us, some of us may have experienced this in our families, whereas you may have been the lighter skin person and, and you may, uh, may, may, may have, uh, unconsciously received some some privileges or more privileges or mm, how would I say this or it may have been treated 
treated differently than your darker skin uh, sister or cousin. Favorite, uh, but favoritism. there are a lot of the favoritism. Now there are a lot of light skinned women that say that they suffer because of their light skin, or light not not just women, but people that say that uh, they may have suffered because they're not accepted in some of the groups of black people because of their light skin, especially if they're quote unquote um, of mixed race. Mm -hmm. So people may not feel that they are not black black enough. Yeah, not black enough, not black enough, or you just don't fit in. Um, Mm -hmm. And and they've had to, like, prove their blackness. Mm -hmm. And then we have the whole story with the tragic mulatto that that's a whole other topic that we should really get into and have an expert come on and speak about uh, the tragic mulatto case with, with some of the... Uh, women that are, are biracial or of mixed race and all the struggles that they experience and uh, what happens to the tragic mulatto because the tragic mulatto like Halle Berry they often have all kinds of problems in relationships they always have to it, it's just it's just some some type of issues that they have some psychological issues that generally lead to suicide and that's why they, they're called the tragic Mulatto. That's a whole concept. Um, there, there are quite a few writings on tragic mulatto. Frances Ellen Harper, uh, I think she used to write on passing, and well, she did write on passing. I'm trying to think if she wrote about the tragic mulatto. So, um, but anyway, so colorism, 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 uh, prejudice. Most of the time, when we think about colorism, we think about how darker skinned women uh, feel that they are uh, not treated as e- as equal to a lighter skin, a lighter skin tone woman. They're not treated uh, with certain advantages as a lighter right. skin woman, and and all of the, um, I guess uh, the nuances that go along with that. And um, now I had an aunt. I had an aunt that was, um, she was a, a lighter skin tone sister. And I've mentioned this before. If it were not for my uncle, one of my uncles that was always telling me that I had beauty and brains, I probably would have felt like that. I probably would have felt like I'm not as as attractive as my aunt. But I thought I was just as pretty and just as cute as possible because I had <laughs> family members that always told me that, and particularly my uncle Calvin, he always, that's my mom's oldest brother, and he plays the drums too, he lives his dream now. He's playing the drums. I think yeah. that's awesome. I think no matter how old you are, he's like 60-something, and he just mm-hmm. started living his dreams, playing right. drums in a band. So, but anyway, he would always tell me that, and, and he just ingrained it in me and instilled that in me, and so I just always felt like I was cute. I felt like I was cute. I felt like I was smart. He was always telling me that I was smart because I was. I am. But anyway, mm-hmm. and so <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't want to disappoint him either by not having good grades in school because he thought that I was smart. He would always tell me that. So it's it's so important what you uh, uh, say around your children and what you what you tell them, what you share with them about themselves. So uh, light skin, let me ask you this, Featherlight. Did you know that light skin blacks earn 10% to 20% more than darker skin blacks? No, I did not. I, I did, did not. I, did. I didn't know. I, I knew that it affected the position, but mm-hmm. it, it didn't go that far as to the salary. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the salary. That's very interesting. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that. Let's take a break and let's pick up on our topic, colorism and barriers that women of color face. We'll be right back. You're tuned in to the Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. And as we take this break, be sure to go on to Black Talk Radio Network page and donate to the Black Talk Media Project. You're tuned in to Mind, Body, and Spirit. We'll be back.
Make Black Talk Radio your choice for digital black radio. New black media for the new millennium. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Uh, uh, uh. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Uh, uh. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Somebody needs to make a remix of, of that song. They Dane sure Brown. do. They really do. Yeah. And let me it's just sing all of her. I want to sing that part. <laughs> I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. All right. So we are back here at the Mind, Body, and Spirit radio show. Namaste, Featherlight. Namaste. 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 Yeah, we, we're, we're in the singing mood tonight. We're in the singing mood. We make a song out of anything. But uh, we're talking about colorism, assimilation, and other barriers of uh, women, uh, other barriers, excuse me, for women of color. You can call in, you can call in to 866 510 Nine zero two five. That's eight six six five one zero nine zero two five. And press star star to unmute yourself, and you can join in the conversation if you like. So we shared this quote, um, that ten, stat rather that ten to. Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to get my words together, people. So just bear with me. There's just so much that I, that we have to share tonight. This is a topic that we will have to have a ongoing conversation about. At first I thought, you know, maybe like a part two and part three, but I think that this should be an ongoing conversation because this is something that we cannot just try to condense into 30 or 45 minutes of discussion. And um, I actually, yes, I reached out to uh, the colorismhealing.org um, people, the sisters that uh, run that that run that um, web page, and this is where I was able to pick up this stat: the ten percent to twenty percent more. Ten, ten to twenty percent is the amount or the number that light skinned blacks earn versus darker skinned blacks. They earn ten to twenty percent more in their salaries or income, mm-hmm. and that is according to colorismhealing.org. So colorism is a global phenomenon, and as mentioned, this is the prejudice of discrimination based on the relative lightness or darkness of the skin, generally a phenomenon occurring within one's own ethnic groups. So this happens, this is, this is a conversation that we have, um, and, and it comes from structural racism, policies, and practices in place that perpetuate colorism. And so we have to, like, change this as a society by understanding who we are, knowing thyself, um, becoming more aware, and understanding our history and the struggles that we've experienced. Uh, I want to share this quote by Alice Walker. Unless the, co- unless the question of colorism is addressed in our communities, we cannot as a people progress. For colorism, by colonialism, sexism, and racism, impedes us. And that's a quote, a statement by Alice Walker. You know, Brother Light, I remember back in the day, <clears throat> people used to say, when a baby was born, you look at the the baby's ears, the tips of the <laughs> ears, mm-hmm. and you can see yeah. how dark the baby will, will become. We're growing right. to right. the right. shade of the baby. So that was something that yeah. people used to do. And then there were certain families, like in Memphis, where I come from, we used to hear that the Ford family, the mm. Ford family, um, there was this, I guess, uh, uh, Harold Ford, Congress in Harold Ford. Yeah. Really that was not it was it, it right that's the force yeah Con- uh, politicians so it was like it was known that the fours were these extremely light skinned family and 
it's like everyone knew that the sports would always marry what they called marry up. So mm -hmm. it was forbidden to marry someone darker than the family's color. So because wow. the whole family just was like a whole group of mulattoes, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, the Fords would, always, would often marry up, and those that did not marry up, they were, it seemed like they were ostracized. They were ostracized. I remember mm -hmm. seeing one one um, female, Harold Ford Jr.'s wife, one of his wives. She was mm -hmm. sort of not quite dark, but she was nowhere near light, 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 light. Exactly. And, and he was always considered a bad boy, too, wasn't right, he? Right, right, mm -hmm. right. There's always mm -hmm. one. There's always one that goes against the family tradition. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they were always in the paper, always in the paper. Yes, some, yes, some, yes. Some mess that they were going through, they, they were always breaking up and fighting. So, mm -hmm. I'm sure he was called the, literally the black sheep. Yeah, yeah. So he's one that didn't marry up, and so that was the thing. Now, there's has anyone ever heard of the brown paper bag test? Mm -hmm. And this is old school right here. Right. So, like, I know you know. We, we've t often yeah. spoken of this. And so for people yes, that yes. aren't aware, the brown paper bag test, do, do you want to share that, what that brown paper bag test is, Feather Light? Well, just imagine a brown paper bag, mm -hmm. the color. I, I see it vividly because I grew up with it. But you place your face against this bag, and if it's not... Um, if it's not the same color or lighter than the bag, then you don't pass. You cannot be admitted into whatever it is you're trying to get into. Howard University was originally only for uh, very light-skinned people. I believe they were uh, visiting mulattoes, the, the uh, children of, of uh, the master. And so they wanted a school for their children. And so Howard University was originally just for very light-skinned people. AKA the sorority brown paper bag test. Ah, uh, you're a little darker. No, nope. you know. So I used had to hear about the AKAs. Yeah, the AKAs were yeah. for the lighter skinned women, and the deltas were for the darker skin. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There was a church in Memphis, uh, Metropolitan Church. Only, only light skinned people <laughs> could yeah. be members. I used to hear that they used to administer that brown paper bag test. So if, right. if you didn't pass, if you were not what they call light, bright, damn near white, has anybody ever heard yes. of that one? Light, bright, oh, yeah. damn near white. Damn near white. <laughs> you had to be light, bright, damn near white damn near to get white. in that church. Yes, mm. ma'am. And that was the case. Um, that was like that was like the system in place, the implied mm -hmm. system in place for entrance or admittance to certain fraternities, sororities, mm -hmm. institutions, uh, career opportunities, all types of communities. So in uh, New Orleans, I wasn't aware of this. I mean, I know that New Orleans had their whole little blue vein society, which they still do have that. There's mm -hmm. a group of black people that live in one of those little corner side pockets in Louisiana where everybody in that little town look white, but they are black, black, black. They say when you have a when it's a funeral, when they have a funeral, um, like <laughs> this says, when they when they have a funeral, um, <laughs> you'll see all of these people that look white, and then you may see one little old black person to come in there and just blow it off for everybody. <laughs> wow! Wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. What? Aunt so on so oh yeah, oh yeah, they they're big into that. In fact I had a friend um she's she's from that area and she spoke about this and it just happened we were around another person that was also from around that area in Louisiana and she confirmed that there's a little small town but that's when you when you wow. dig into the history of New Orleans that's when they had, that's in Louisiana is where they used to have those octoroon parties where all the octoroon women would come. One ace, your one ace ancestry is uh, African. 
with the Octa Room. And so uh, they would have those Octa Room parties. Now, at one, one time there was a party, uh, I think it was called a Shambo party. Um, there was this party uh, with the Octa Room, and they were all invited to come. And when they arrived, the host handed each one of those Octa Room women their husband head in a box. <laughs> So right. these people, they didn't care nothing about you being beautiful. And see, this goes back to what I just mentioned about the tragic mulatto. The tragic mulattoes were always going through some type of turmoil. And so, like, a lot of people, the sisters that were made to feel so ugly and broke down, at least they still had their spirit, many of them, because it, you know how it is when you're on the outside looking in. So many of those sisters, they were looking at the octoroon like, oh, she's so pretty, she's treated so so well. But the octoroon right. sisters oftentimes were experiencing a lot of turmoil. Like I said, just imagine uh, you receive a box and you're thinking, oh, Mr. Good Master is giving me a nice gift, and he has yeah. your husband's head in there, a declaration of war. Oh, sure. Anyway, so... Um, I did not know. I did know about the uh, paper bag parties, but I was unaware that New Orleans actually did have a caste system, very similar to the caste system that exists in India. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, they had a caste system there in New Orleans. Um, Let's see. I did want to share this, too. So this is like a global phenomenon, Aja. So like, you know, a feather light in Brazil and India and the West Indies, there's a, there's, a, there's this colorism phenomenon there because um, in Brazil, the darker skinned Brazilians are the ones that are often living in those favelas. Uh, fav- I can't get the word right, the name of those. The, the homes that the poor people live in and are often evicted from, like when uh, the Olympics was scheduled there. Oh, India, yeah. we often mm-hmm. see the lighter skinned Indians, but they're the, that, there's that group of quote unquote untouchables or like the original in, uh, uh, Indians that are dark. Because remember, um, Fellow Light here in Houston, there were some Indians that we were friends with that were darker than we are. Right. I mean, just as dark or dark. Now, one of yeah. them I know was darker than me. Because I was like, and you say you're not black, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're darker than yeah. me. Yeah. So, I mean. When, <clears throat> when, uh, when Larry came down and we were in the in the line at the grocery store, a group of a family were, were in the line across from us. And there was one gentleman who about mm, maybe two and a half shades darker than me, and I'm dark. And so he said, well, well what, is, what is he? And I said, he's an Indian. <laughs> he's Indian. He's Indian. I said, um, they have a caste system in their country, whereas the, the, the darker you are, are the less privileges that you have. And, and so a lot of them come, come here to, to this country, and he said, and be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, we have the same prejudice existing here. Um, another interesting fact to share, in the 1930s, during the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance, Harlem, USA, to work at the Cotton Club, one had to be light, bright, and damn near white. Now, after Duke Ellington, who I love so much, but after Duke Ellington departed, Cab Calloway demanded that his chocolate bunnies be allowed to grace the stage. And so if you've ever seen any of the footage of um, the performances of Cab Calloway at the Harlem Renaissance, there were those little dancers, all the dancers, um, that were on stage and performing and working the club. Well, Cab Calloway wanted to have the chocolate bunnies on stage. And this caused a rift between him and the club's owner. And apparently they went back and forth on this because Cab Calloway threatened to walk away. Cab Calloway was like, forget it. You know, I'm Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to perform here. 
But everybody knows mm. the at the, the the Cotton Club was like the place. The Cotton Club, right. it's the Cotton Club. And so for yes. Cab Calloway to take their stand and demand mm. that darker-skinned sisters have the opportunity to perform just like those light, bright, damn near white sisters, I mm -hmm. definitely commend him. And we're going to have to, have to honor Cab Calloway for our African we will. spirit. Yes. Yes. After finding that yes. out, I was like, no. you, yes. I was like, thank yes. you. Thank you, Ancestor yes. Cab Calloway, for kicking down that door. So that's right. why these darker skinned sisters were allowed. And he broke that whole colorism taking place right there in the Cotton Club. Mwah. Love you, Cab Calloway. Mwah. One person. Adi, 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 adi. Adi, adi, adi. Adi, adi, so anyway, uh, you yeah, what, would, what would you like to share? Oh, what would you like to share with us? With one person. I mean, that was one person, and and mm -hmm. and look at the the ripple effect, you know, that it made within that within that move. I mean, how many how many dark skinned women got the opportunity to to to, to showcase their talent in front of an audience by that move that he made. So whatever one person could do, some, sometimes people just say, well, I'm just one person. Well, so was he. So, so was I he. give props to him, to oh. all men, to stand up for the African queen in whatever way you can. Yeah. Absolutely. So there were some comparisons or, or some uh, some of these some of the uh, actresses and some of the films, like Martin, that you wanted to share with mm -hmm. us, that you want to share with us also? Yes. Um, the media's portrayal of dark-skinned women. Right, right. So um, this has been going on for, for for some time. Of course, we know where it started in, in slavery, uh, as, as it was uh, said on the clip that you just heard earlier. Um, we came over dark brown, dark, black, and uh, because of the owners of these enslaved people were having sex with these women, they created children who got lighter and lighter. So, and they were, of course, the lighter you were, uh, the better treatment you received because you look more like the owner. So this has been carried on for, for centuries, and the media pushes it in different, uh, sometimes subtle uh, manners, uh, and sometimes it's, it's just, just in your face. Um, and then the uh, a lot of our uh, a lot of our men they uh, they will continue this on, and of course the younger men see this, and it's a ripple effect. But in so far as the media is concerned, the structural racism. Uh, that perpetuates colorism, uh, they more often than not portray the dark-skinned woman, as you notice, as violent, uneducated, and unattractive, um, whereas the fair-skinned females are portrayed in a positive light, a more of a positive light. Little boys mm -hmm. go up seeing the fair-skinned woman as the beauty queen and the favored one while seeing uh, the dark skinned women is, is wretched and impoverished and, 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 and seeing these seeing these images on T V, in the media, and being seen uh act, actual uh people uh uh displaying these preferences. I mean what you see is 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 it impacts your thinking. Um take a look at some of the uh the examples we have here, some racist film companies often produce films that, that perpetuate this type of uh, stereotype. So um, female groups, like, like the movie Star. I started watching that. I thought, oh, let's see what's this one. And I saw it immediately. The, um, the light-skinned girl um, 
Oh, it's just the lead part. And and it's clear that she's not really the best singer, but some kind of way she has worked, worked her way in to be uh, the lead singer, the lead uh, of the whole group. And I could see the message said, okay, click. And then Dream Girls, the same thing, the lighter-skinned female gets to be the lead singer, the guy also the talent. Uh, Empire. Okay, you got Cookie, and then you got, what is it, Kitty Boo Boo? Um, <clears throat> Boo Boo Kitty, Anika. 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 And Anika, okay, so Cookie, Cookie, Cookie. <laughs> cookie. Uh, <laughs> it's portrayed as, as abrasive, and and um, she has uh, flashy attire. She can be violent, um, loud. And then you have her rival, uh, Kitty Boo Boo. She's uh, soft spoken. She always has some classy, conservative suit on, and and she, you know, she never raises her voice. Now she'll kill you, but she uh, doesn't raise her voice. And then you right. have um, coming to America. Okay, you got the dark skin sister. She was just portrayed as um, gyrating, man hungry, trying <laughs> to, to to steal her sister's uh, ex. Uh, annoying, just all kinds of negative, negative mm-hmm. manners that she was presented, and then the light skinned sister, smart, ambitious, desired, the, f- the favorite by many, and she was she, yes. she was the favorite sister, most desired, yes, yes, Martin and Gina, you got Pam, mm-hmm. what they call mm-hmm. ugly Pam, Pam had a gorgeous face. Still has a gorgeous I figure. I love Tanisha Arnold. I love I that. absolutely yes. love her. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and um, Martin was always making jokes about her looking like a man. Calling her BDB. Um, yes. Pam always had this growling, mean mug look on her face. She did. Pam she is did. so beautiful. Pam still looks the same way she looked, what, 20 years ago when she was playing Pam, yep. uh, the right. character Pam right. on Martin. Martin mm-hmm. Lyon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Martin. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this Gina, and, and, and Gina, was, Gina was Gina, but I mean, it, it yeah. wasn't like Gina was this beautiful uh Tiki, what's 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 Tiki's name? The sister that plays on Tyler Perry's show, Tiki Sumter. Oh, Tina was not a Tiki Sumter baby. Tiki Sumter is drop dead mm-hmm. gorgeous with her chocolate yeah. chocolate skin. I mean, no mm-hmm. offense. Um, what's her name? But I mean, Tiki Sumter is just drop dead gorgeous. But some people would still uh, perceive. Gina, what's what's Gina's um, name? I'm calling her Gina. I can't even think of her name right now. I'm drawing a blank. I'm having the old people's <laughs> brain freeze. Um, but anyway, Gina on Martin, and uh, some people would say, "Oh, she's she she looks better than Tiki Sumter only because of her skin tone." And see, that's what colorism is about. That's that's really that's a problem with uh, colorism. <laughs> Tisha Campbell, yes, that's her name, because she's married to Dwayne Martin. So, um, yeah, that's 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 the problem with colorism. Those are the issues that we see. Someone would not even give someone like a a, a man wouldn't give Tiki Sumter a second glance because of her dark skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But would say I, um, she, T- Tisha Campbell is drop dead gorgeous. Is. And we she have is. to we have to recognize both sisters as being beautiful for whatever they have inside of them. Because what I always share with people is what I had to share with a, a friend once that was always in the mirror. You can go out here and get hit by a truck and smash your face. So you want that man to love you for you, so that he will be there with your smashed face while you're lying up in the hospital mm. bed or mm. paralyzed from the neck down. He'll still love you. Yeah. So anyway, I just had to share that a little bit. That piece. So, well, there's... Um, to continue. I wanted to 
also also um, give a comment that was made by a photographer. Um, he's a white photographer, European, and he stated that it's interesting how um, some of the, the rap artists would uh, uh, profess about their, their, their black pride, but then when they had their, their video shoot, they would always have either uh, European women in there or mixed women, very, very few, if any, uh, dark-skinned women. And he stated mm. he thought that this was hypocritical, and he felt that it sends the wrong message to the younger generation. And and, and I, I have to agree, you're either this way or you're mm -hmm. bad. I mean, black pride is black pride. You know, um, some of the some of the artists are are very blatant, blatant with their um, their statements about dark skinned women. Um, young bro, why you I guess everybody knows who that is. is that young bro. Name? Yes, young What's bro. Why you what? Bro, B R O, like brother. Oh, okay, okay, bro. Okay, so this is a statement that he made, a public statement. He said, mm -hmm. "Dark butts is what I call dark skinned women. I don't oh, date Lord. women. I don't date women darker than me." I didn't bother to even look up his face, um, <laughs> and he's probably looking day. like. Some um, <laughs> uh, tissue paper that's it, been it, walked over at a in an amusement park over a million times. Yes, like a piece yes. Of trash. Just I, I like last year, and st I mean, give me a break. And uh, these are the main people, like Little Wayne, making comments like this, and you looking at them like, uh, bruh, you could date a roach. That's what you, you know, <laughs> you, you should be happy if a roach dates you. Okay, anyway, so go ahead on with the, uh... Okay, oh, Neo. Let's, let's, I, let's, let's, let's take a quick break before we come to Neo, because I do okay. want to hear what you have to say about Neo, because I do recall, I believe, on social media, some people kind of, like, getting at him about his little slimy, greasy comments about dark skin women. We'll be right back. You're tuned in to the Mind, Body, and Spirit Radio Show. Black Talk Media Project launched the digital radio platform, Black Talk Radio Network, the first such platform created to serve the black community specifically. Black Talk Radio Network has grown with a variety of radio hosts, digital radio stations, and podcasters. Web analytics say Black Talk Radio, the platform, has an online reach that ranks it among the top independent black media platforms in the world. All of this is possible because of financial contributions to the nonprofit Black Talk Media Project. If you love the work we do and the voices and perspectives we bring to you every day make a donation today to ensure that black talk radio is here in the future black talk radio is new black media for the new millennium all right and we're back here at the mind body and spirit radio show and don't forget to go on to the black talk radio network and donate so that you can get your black talk Radio Matters t-shirt, and you can also sign up for DTR and alternative social media platform. All right, so we are talking about colorism, and, and as we mentioned, colorism and assimilation and barriers uh, that women of color face, and 
as I mentioned, just like I, th- I believe it was like last night, I said, you know what, this will have to be an ongoing conversation. We cannot mm-hmm. unpack these topics in 30 minutes. There's just mm-hmm. no way, no way. So um, I did have another clip that I know it would be great for people to hear, but we'll just have to pick back up on that um, on another day. Are another show, honoring- another day. Yes, we're, we are going to honor Prince, and then you have a piece that you're going to read. But I want you to finish and share that piece about Neo, and I want to hear your uh, spoken word, Seven Light, and then we'll honor okay. Prince. All right. Okay, so this is this is what... Neo had to say, all the prettiest kids are light skinned anyway. Oh, Lord, I, like I did Neo. really like Neo, but now I'm not so fond of Neo. Okay, well, so you know what? Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Can I say this on, on that quickly? Now, go ahead. And, and I, I, I know because I, I, I had to think about like uh, what I said about what's her name? What's that chick name? Look, I forgot her name. <laughs> oh, I was with her. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, 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 that girl I was talking about, uh, well, you know, uh, we got a lot. I can't even think of it. I, I really forgot about you, Miss Singh. And I did like you. But anyway, I was, a, I was so upset with her for not standing up for Kim Burrell. But you know what? Like in this case with Neil, we have to, look at these guys. Well, I'm learning to look at them and say, that's a mental issue, and it's been conditioned yes, through colonialism, is. and I'm not going to let them divide us with this colonialism, yeah. uh, you are right. you are a so Jedi right. mind so trick right. that they play it on them, play it on us. But, brother, once we hip you to the Jedi mind trick that has been played on you to make you sit here and think that your skin, to- skin tone is not attractive, whatever skin tone it is, um, not to just sit here and, and, and exclusively date lighter skinned women because you think that they are better looking, that they're more attractive, but date them because that's what you prefer. Any any range of color, and when it comes to a woman, so I'm gonna kind of look at it like that. I'll I'll take that position more so now. Now I'm, I'm not gonna keep giving these brothers a break though. Once we tell you, or sisters. I'm not going to keep giving these people a break on this because once you are once once you are aware, once you know better, then it's up you you are responsible to do better. And we're in the okay. age of information, so you can't just sit here and keep trying to walk around and and disrespect women or men anymore. I mean that 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 has to cease. We we know better, so we 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 should and know that, what the game is. Okay, so I just have yeah. to share that piece on Neo. But I won't be buying your records or anything. Not that I have anyway, so I mean, I guess you probably say it don't matter. You never bought my records anyway. I sure did, Neo. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. You sound like I was either. Right, dude. Okay. I, had, I, wanted, right. I don't even try to buy a magazine that you're on. I mean, that's just how I am. So whatever. I, I was just liking his style with his hair. But anyway, Kevin Hart. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, I really Kevin Hart, he does not get a pass. Like I'm sorry. No, no, like he's old enough. I never no. have liked him, even before I heard this statement. I never, mm-hmm. yeah. No, no, no he's talking he's about a, him. He's it's not funny to me. He's not funny. I can be more funny than you on stage, Kevin Hart, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Shoot. Anyway, well, I can come up said, with some jokes. Light skinned women usually have better credit than dark skinned women. What? WTF? Then he says, broke ass dark hoes. What? Oh. And then he says, well, you know, I, 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 I'm a comedian. I make jokes. Oh, I was just being silly. But yeah, then he made it so very silly. clear that he doesn't joke about gays. So it's okay to joke about dark women, but you can't cross the line and joke. But you're a comedian. Right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, let me psychoanalyze... Uh, Kevin Hart right quick. Let me psychoanalyze him because he like okay. Uh he uh, uh Kevin Hart like uh Wesley Snipes two short uh small stature black men that black women like myself 
wouldn't give a second look to because I just don't like short men. And so he probably, I love dark-skinned men. I love men. Like I said, I, I wouldn't mind having two of them. <clears throat> but uh, now, now Wesley Snipes and Kevin Hart, they're small, statured, they're short, they're physique, you know, they're very, very small. They're probably like two inches taller than I am, if, if that. If that Kevin Hart, he's probably my height, so I wouldn't give him the time of day. So people like that, they have probably encountered women like me, and now they want to uh, uh, disregard and disrespect all darker skinned women because of some some silly mess like that. Well, she she mistreated me and things like that. And and that's what people do. Oh well, you you date three black men. Oh, I, I don't want to date. I don't want to date black men anymore because they mistreated you or whatever. <laughs> and so right. unfortunately, right. That's, that's, right. that's those other things happen because I read that Wesley Snipes was like, yeah, black women didn't want to give me the time of day, so that's why I started dating Asian women. I don't know how true huh. that is, but yeah, I, I, heard, he I heard date that Asian too. women. He used to date Halle Berry. And, you know, people used to say that he was the one that. Um, bust Halle Berry up against <laughs> I'm not going to laugh about it because that's horrible but he's the one that um, assaulted Halle Berry which is why she's right. uh, partially deaf in one ear. I used to hear that right. rumor back in the day. They say Halle Berry worrisome as hell when it comes to a relationship and that's a shame because she's so beautiful but I've heard several men say she just becomes a pest Oh, she's too pretty to be a pest like that anyway mm -hmm. Oh, have nice Halle, come to call me. Inside. I'll tell you how to work them, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tragic mulatto. Tragic mulatto. So, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. And I love Halle Berry. I love Halle Berry. I was hoping that eventually she would be able to recognize her inner beauty, not just her outer beauty, but her inner beauty. So, anyway, um... Would you like to share your Jill Scott piece? Because we need to close this topic out, unfortunately, because I'm so into this. But I do want to hear your piece. Or Do you have any more comments on colorism or barriers? Well, go I have time. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, because, okay. I mean, it's all, it's all you now, baby. It's just all you and... <laughs> Yeah. I just save my okay. piece. I, I kinda wanted to kinda wanted to say on on um colorism. It's it's okay uh people to prefer certain types of people, uh for whatever reason. Uh, but until we until we sit down and and realize how the inequalities that we've been forced to live with has affected how we view the world as well as how we view ourselves and, mm -hmm. and, and, and our psyche. We can't say for certain as to why these choices are made. There was a, a guy who came to my home to visit my husband this is way back when, and he sat at my kitchen table and said, as I was walking by, I don't date that. I don't date that. I see women. <laughs> I have to stop in my track and do a little back thing like the what? Mm. Okay. Okay, I'm not one to go crazy. I'm always respectful. Mm -hmm. I waited mm -hmm. until his ass walked out and told him, my husband, do not ever let him grace my doorway ever again. Mm -hmm. And I just, I mean, I was just amazed that they're still, I mean, that's been so long ago, that people are still with that mindset, with that mindset, uh, uh, when we when we worked at the the Slave Haven Underground Railroad Museum, and we were given the tour, and we were showing the pictures of the racism, and this beautiful young girl, she was about twenty or whatever, and she said, um, I, "I I get that a lot." Uh, we were like, "What?" She said, "Guys say that I'm pretty to be dark," and I'm like, "Bill." Mm -hmm. I can't, I cannot, it's just, it's just amazing, but it's a generational thing, and like, and like you just said, until we realize where this is coming from, um, mm -hmm. 
it will it will continue. It will continue to divide us, and um, it just it just needs a little bit more more discussion. It's one of those uh, say elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about. It. There are actually people who say uh, it doesn't exist. Mm. But mm. anyway, let's let's. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, as you said before, uh, we we have to look at those who are lost with empathy yeah. and understanding. Yeah, with yeah. love and understanding, we can heal and grow. We can heal and grow. We can yeah. heal. And grow. Yeah. Um, there uh, is. Yeah. There there's um. There's this statement that I read by Denzel. I would like to share. Denzel shared this with his daughter uh, because she is a student at, I think, NYU. And let's see, let me get to this statement, okay. So uh, Denzel Washington revealed in a roundtable with the Hollywood Reporter the advice he gives to his daughter, who was an aspiring actress at NYU. So um, Denzel says, I tell my daughter, you're black, you're a woman, and you are, you're dark-skinned at that. So you have to be a triple, quadruple threat. Look at Viola Davis. That's who you want to be. You want to be her. Forget about the little pretty girls because if you're relying on that, when you hit 40, you're out the door. You better save. You better have some chops. So mm. that is some, some mm. words of uh, wisdom that Denzel shares with his daughter. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and ne- next time when we have this topic, I'll share what J. Cole mentioned about, mentions in respect to our barriers that some women uh, face versus men. So, uh, Featherlight, mm-hmm. would you like to share your spoken word? Okay. Uh, okay. okay. This, <laughs> this one is by. Jill Scott. So uh, this is already a song, okay, and what I'm going to do is turn it into a spoken word because I love the uh, the, love of the, the lyrics. And it is in tune with the plight of the black woman, the plight of the African woman. Black men, from my heart, from our heart, I am not the one you should be making your enemy. So these lyrics by Jill Scott, very conscious African mm-hmm. woman, so, it's it's called How It Make You Feel. Hmm. How it make you feel. What if what if I was gone forever? No more chocolate kisses. No more nappy dugout ever. Mm-mm. No mama, no daughter, no sister. No sister friend. Tell me, my brother, what would become of you then? What about if, poof, every black female in the world disappeared? Your man child left unattended oh, with no one behind the steering wheel. Tell me, hmm, how would that make you feel? Your beautiful brown would be forever gone. With no more cocoa wounds to carry your brown on. You, like that would be the last of your kind. Can you feel this, my brother? How does that affect your mind? Because if there was no me, there would be no you. Can you feel me? Is this getting to you? That's the science in this, but it's so much more intense. Reach into your soul for the answer. Reach wherever you need to to find it. 
how would that make you feel? No mama, no daughter, no grandma, no auntie. Nobody that look like you. Think about it. Think about it. What if oof, every black female in the world just disappeared? Say you be tripping. Say you pimping it. Talking about how you the man. What you are is something different. Byproduct of when master ruled your life. Spreading babies everywhere, couldn't think, couldn't care, but you can now. You can, you can. Come on and man up. Emma, tell me, how would you feel? No mama, no auntie. What about if poof? We <sighs> are just a one woman show. I was just <laughs> envisioning you as usual on stage performing. <laughs> that was beautiful. I, I do love that song by Jill Scott. But I, I just, I wish that I could just see you actually perform that. Mm. Mm. Yes, the, the the beauty of a woman, her presence, her glory. Oh, so much love. The black woman is strong, resourceful, exotic, brilliant, and supportive, sassy, and bold. We got the patience of jobs, some of us independent, dependent, and a million of other things. We like the watch ad. We take a licking and we keep on ticking. Baby, we are healing and willing. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes. So beautiful we are. Thank you for sharing that feather light. You are. Why do you thank you for sharing that piece? Well, you know what? We need to honor Prince for our African yes. spirit segment before we go into our love the body and breathing because we only have a few minutes. So I'll make this brief um, and Pisces, um, our African spirit piece. Mm, 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 mm. All right. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Prince, one of my favorites. Do do we have any? Do we have any like intro music for Prince, Scotty? If you're still there, you still there, Scotty? Do we have any intro music for this musical? honoring Jim Simmons. Tonight we're honoring Prince, as I mentioned, June 7th, 1958 is the date he was born. And Prince, um, this this musical innovator has this enormous vault of music. Okay, Prince, in watching this documentary, I learned that Prince would sometimes, okay, Prince said that he would write a, write a song a day. And... He would he could write an album, like in no time, right? And so by the time his by the time Warner Brothers wanted to send him out to like promote the album that he submitted to Warner Brothers, he's already written like two albums. He said, so he was just that type of musical Amazing. genius. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, he was like an instrumentalist, a philanthropist. Prince actually. Um, donated ton, um, uh, millions of dollars. Well, I don't know millions. Don't don't let me quantify it. Prince was a donator to families in need, um, and also Prince was Prince was an artist who uh, was involved and invested in the solar panel industry. So he would provide solar mm-hmm. solar panels for various families. 
This record producer was known for his flamboyant stage presence, presence, extravagant dress, and his wide vocal range. And one thing that Prince was known for was bringing the fasado, fasado, and the funk merging those two those two uh, sounds, and just producing this funk. R&B, new wave, soul, merged with some psychedelia and pop. He sold over 100 million records worldwide. And when he came out with, um, when he produced Purple Rain, I think that was 1984. Oh, my God. He was not even like the major star that he evolved to become at that time. And people... When he first began speaking about uh, producing this film, Purple Rain, about his life, and he's going to film it in Minnesota, people were like, oh, really? That's going to be a flop. Mm-hmm. But by the time mm-hmm. by the time he hit that red carpet to promote the uh, very first um, screening of Purple Rain, I mean, everybody was so excited. This was like the the, the the event, the screening of Purple Rain, uh, Prince's <laughs> film. So we're honoring Prince tonight. And, uh, you know, one day I'll have to start reading, reading some of those quotes, that friend, not necessarily quotes, but um, little stories, short stories that people that interacted with Prince shared in this extremely long article. I mean, so many different people from... I mean, like Van Jones to Friends, Tavis Smiley, different people that interacted with Prince share their uh, most memorable moments. I tell you, and I always did want to take my grandmother to go visit Prince because I went to see my first, well, not necessarily visit Prince, but at least see Paisley Park and maybe we could go to a concert in Minneapolis and meet him. Because if I could make it that far to go see him, then I would definitely make sure that my grandmother gets a chance to meet him. I would have been like, Prince, you got to talk to my granny because <laughs> she loves you. <laughs> oh, but, um, yeah, seeing him in concert is awesome. If you've never seen him in concert, mm, 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 you missed it because his concert was like the second concert that I've ever seen. And so uh, my first concert was Michael Jackson. But, uh, Fellow Lights, you want to share your... Um, Mind, body, and spirit. We'll close out Prince tonight. And you know, I can go on and on about him. I love Prince. Prince is my dude, my guy. Uh, rest in music, my brother. Thank you for sharing all oh, that music. He taught me how to be free. Listening to his mm-hmm. music taught me how to be free. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because he said, uh, Where I come from, we don't give a damn. We do whatever we please. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. I close. I have, we don't care, talking about free men. Everybody's going uptown. Mm-hmm. That was my jam back in the day. So, yeah. <laughs> Prince taught me how to be free, and that's why I'm free now. Emancipation, when he wrote that album, Emancipation, when he freed himself from uh, the enslavement. And that's one thing I do want to mention. I'm sorry for the light. I'm going into a little oh, bit of your time. But I have to mention this about Prince. Prince was the one that um, exposed how the music industry was basically a slave plantation and uh, continuing with their with with another method of enslavement. Thus, Mm -hmm. he had slaves scrawled on the side of his face, and he became the symbol person. And I was watching this interview uh, with Oprah at his home, and she said, "She said, well, what do I call you? This is one when he changed his, well, um, he didn't use the name Prince because he was on the contract mm-hmm. with Warner Brothers, which which was brilliant, right. the way that he was able to. It was, 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 was that. so brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. He was able to maneuver through that. He said, okay, I got you. Since you own this name, Prince, guess what? I'm going to be the symbol person. And um, right. so he came up with this, and you can actually, you can actually uh, type out that symbol. Um, this mm-hmm. was uh, in, in the interview to show you how to type out the symbol, symbol and uh, to make Prince Prince symbol name at that time. 
Anyway, so I want to share this quickly before we close out. So Oprah said to Prince, well, since you're no longer Prince, what do I call you? And you know what his response was? It was so beautiful. He said, well, I hope that you would just call me friend. Oh. I just love that. I love that so much. I mean, I know that in African cultures, names have meanings, but that was just... Mm -hmm. So simplistically beautiful, yeah, the way that he said yeah. it too. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I looked real well up in my eye. Yeah, I mean, I did. Mm -hmm. I looked real well up. I was like, oh, he's just such a beautiful person. He's just mm -hmm. such a beautiful person. I love him, love him, love him, love him. So, um, Kelly, come on, give us some yeah. mind, body, and spirit, and close us out with some breathing. Okay, I'm going to give you two quick. Um, tip one minute immunity boost this boosts your immune system in one minute take a one minute cold shower to ward off illness research has shown that a cold water the cold water stimulates your immune production the theory is that the body tries to warm itself during and after a cold shower which speeds up the metabolic rate activating the immune system Here's another tip. Um, coffee nap. A 20-minute coffee nap can make you more alert. Drink a cup of coffee, caffeinate it. It takes about 20 minutes for the caffeine to affect your brain. Then immediately take a nap or rest calmly if you can't fall asleep. And the combination of a brief rest and the caffeine in the coffee makes you more alert when you get up. Okay, let's time to breathe. Raise your shoulders up to your ears. Drop in. Okay. Up to your ears, drop them. Okay. We're going to do movement with that breathing. Put your left hand on your tummy and take a deep breath in. As you in, raise your right arm over your head. Inhale. Exhale, drop your arm. Inhale, raise. Exhale, drop. Repeat on the other side, switch your hands, inhale up on the left, exhale down, inhale up, inhale down. Do that yourself about 10 times before you go to bed. Makes you feel really, really good in your life. All right. Namaste. Hope you enjoy Namaste. the show and have a wonderful rest of the week. Wonderful, wonderful, prosperous, peace, peace, and the next. Peace, God.